Well, thank you. Uh, I can use these 20 minutes just to deal with this question, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, but first of all, thank you very much for in inviting us. We are three of us here from Iceland. Uh, my colleague spoke on uh, panels yesterday, um, and we are delighted to be here. Thank the organizers and uh, also the, the people from Syrisia, which we have met here. I must say, personally, it's a, it's a dream come true to visit uh, Greece, because I've, I've tried to follow as, as closely as possible the developments here since 2009-10. Um, you may remember that Iceland was a front-runner in the in, in the international global crisis, and we became world famous in the autumn 2008, when our entire banking sector went down in a matter of a few days. We lost 95% of the financial sector almost overnight, with uh, unprecedented uh, consequences for the economy and, and for society. When the problems became more severe in other countries, like Greece, Ireland, Portugal, uh, the first reaction in many of these countries was to distinguish themselves from Iceland and say, yeah, yes, we have some problems, but we are not melting down like, like Iceland. So there was a good deal, good deal of interest also in what happened in Iceland, and I was interviewed several times by Greek media, including your public television, that's to say, while you still had one, uh, uh, because people were interested, and, and there has been a good deal of comparison between these countries, and I think that's, that's fair enough, with the, with the reservation that, of course, each country is different. Now, to your question and to the big question, left in government in two days Europe. Uh, to start with, I can tell you that it's no easy task to go into government, not to mention if the first jobs are to clean up a total mess if you come at the ruins and it's like being on a fire watch every 24 hours a day throughout the week throughout the month year after year i mean enormous undertaking to come to the power in such circumstances my view is that it is always going to be a challenging task for a radical left party to enter government unless you got a, a clean majority you are bound to have to make alliances with others, social democrats or what have you, and it's going to be challenging. If you are a new party or a relatively young party, and this is happening for the first time, it is even a bigger challenge. That I can tell you all about. And if we add on top of that, that you come to the power in unprecedented times of crisis, it can be more difficult. Radical party, new party, first time, and crisis. That's a heavy cocktail. That's a heavy cocktail. Now, uh, and are you likely to get unpopular, and are you likely to lose support and be voted out? Yes, that may well happen, even though you do your best. So am I coming here to say, don't do it? No. <laughs> On the contrary. Nothing has changed my mind that we did the right thing in Iceland to go into government under these frightful conditions. We had less than a week to decide upon it as the old government, the, the neoliberal regime, was practically carried out of the ministries, thrown out by the people, uh, and we had to decide, are we going to dive in and even before elections, we went in and served as a minority government for the first four months to stabilize the situation, then we had elections, and then we were voted in as a minor, majority government. And we did the right thing. That has nothing to do with the fact that four years and four months later we were voted out. What mattered was that this made a world of difference for the Icelandic society. And I'm, I'm convinced, and I think we can prove it beyond doubt, that the Icelandic welfare society benefited enormously from the fact that a left-wing radical government came to power at the height of the crisis and was able to lead the country out of it in the best possible way uh, in, in social terms. And so we did, and we have it on record, we have it 
commented by the IMF, by the OECD, by many uh, international scholars as, such as Paul uh, Krugman and Stieglitz and others, that this is what was uh, particular with the Icelandic program. Um, in the Nordic countries, there were time, a time uh, for le socialistic or left parties in government at the same time. Five if we had Greenland. We were only missing uh, Sweden at a very short period of time. But of course our experience uh, are, is very mixed. After eight years, our friends in the Socialist Party of Norway suffered heavy loss. And the Danish party only lasted one and a half year, then they were out of the government. And, and they are in, almost in dissolution. So there, there is no shortage of examples that prove that this is difficult. But in my mind, it doesn't uh, prove that you shouldn't do it. On the contrary, as I said already. I can respect the view that parties that decide not to ever enter government by choice, I, I understand and I can respect that view, but I don't share it. In my mind, it's contra to the basic principles of the democracy. If you, if you volunteer for a public service and if you get support from the voters, are you then going to come and say, well, no, sorry, I didn't mean it really. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay in opposition. I, I don't think that works really. Uh, at least you have to be very clear and outspoken about your intentions before elections. And I say, go and say, we are ready. We know it's going to be difficult. We have prepared us as well as we can. We cannot promise to solve everything, but we will do our best. And the rewards that we are after are not necessarily to win the next elections, the second elections. It is to be able to look over our work and say, yes, it made a difference. It was good for the ordinary citizens of Greece that Syriza came to the power and was uh, ruling this country for four or eight years. It made an enormous difference. Then future will go as it goes. I'm, I'm going to touch briefly upon three, four concepts, because this is such an enormous task that I think maybe to conceptualize it is, is one way of, of putting the message forward. The first con so concept here is responsibility. Responsibility or trustworthiness. I think it is extremely important that we take the dialogue, we take the fight, on the basis of responsibility. We are the responsible ones. It has, history has told us and the recent experiment, the neoliberal experiment around the world has taught us at least one thing. It is the neoliberals that are totally irresponsible when it comes to public finances. Look at the mess they leave. But they are not just irresponsible in financial terms. They are about as far away from being uh, responsible when it comes to the social dimension and the ecological dimension as anything can be. Uh, I could speak at length about this. And I think the political history of the last decades proves this very clearly. We, in Iceland, we are not the first left-wing government that has to, had to clean up after total failures of the right. It has happened both on national levels in many countries and in, in a lot of regional cases, municipalities. And where these neoliberal philosophies have been brought to the, to the most extremes, like in, like in the municipality of Farum in Denmark, it went bankrupt. They took a rather rich municipality and they succeeded in making it bankrupt in less than 10 years. That was an expensive exercise. Uh, I think uh, the, the irresponsibility of the neoliberals, of the neo-capitalists when it comes to public finances is very understandable. They want to minimize the state. So it's not their worry if the public finances are weak. Then they come and say, well, then we have to cut down. We can't afford all these services. 
So they outsource, they privatize, they cut down. So it doesn't really serve their political goal to have sound, sustainable public finances. Does it? No. Uh, and they cannot uh, 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 lift taxes, so they can do nothing if economical problems arrive. I think probably the clearest case of all about how uh, neoliberals uh, look at public finances are the bushes. Uh, and the very fact that the bushes, both of them, decided to fight very, very expensive wars overseas, but they did not pay for them. They borrowed money to fight their overseas wars. Can you become more irresponsible than that? To expect your children or grandchildren, the future taxpayers, for, for, to pay for your wars overseas? No, I don't think so. Sustainability is another good concept. And probably we should mo use that more in this dialogue. The neo-capitalism of today is about as far away from living up to the criteria of sustainable developments as anything can be. As anything can be. It is not financially sustainable. Of that, we have a new and very costly uh, experiment. It is not environmentally sustainable, and it is not socially sustainable. There we have the three dimensions of sustainable development, and these ideologies, these economies live up to none of them. That's absolutely clear. So can we have that kind of politics, that kind of economical systems in today's world and tomorrow's world? No, we cannot. Inequality is the third concept I want to touch upon. We, are often, we often hear that the biggest problems of today is climatic change, it's global warming, it is uh, draining out of resources and so on. And I'm not saying these are not grave and serious problems, but I would go as far as to say that the biggest and most dangerous problems facing mankind today is inequality. It, is, it, it has reached outrageous scales, again, under the neoliberal era in the Western world. And numbers show this very clearly. Just the other week, the numbers came out that 85 people on this globe own as much net assets as, as half of mankind. Half of the, the people on the globe, 85 people own equally much. Five people in the UK owe as much as 25% of that country. If you look at the, the income gap, as it has developed uh, over the neoliberal era, uh, and take the one, top 1% 1 in US and top 1% in Iceland. I could show you an interesting chart if I had it up on the wall. Well, it's like this. In 1980, the 1% earning most disposable income in the US were earning 10%. 1% was earning 10% of the total amount uh, paid out or, gain, or in capital gains and so on. Now, in the next 20 years, from 1980 to 2000, this number moved up from 10% to 23%. So the 1% of the population uh, gets as much annually in their pocket in terms of disposable income as, as get 23% of everything that is delivered in the economy. Iceland used to lay where around 3 to 4%. The top 1% were earning about 3 to 4% of the total amount. But we managed, when the neoliberal experiment exploded in Iceland, after the millennium and up to 2008, to go from 4% to 20%. We almost reached the same heights as the Americans in 2008. Uh, and of course, we were going uh, up in the Guinea index enormously. Now, we are down to around 5% again. 
among other things, through how we change the tax system. So uh, I could also, of course, go into that, how we tried to take uh, society as softly through the crisis in Iceland as we could. And uh, um, I think we, I have to refer to the numbers and they will have to speak for themselves. But we were relatively successful in re recovering in the economy. We have had about 2.5% growth for the last three years on the average, 2011, 12, 13. Unemployment has dropped down from 9 to 4.5%. And we have done this by still taking as good care of the welfare society as possible. So there are different ways. There are alternatives. It's a matter of political choice. I think our duties, of course, lie first and foremost with the ordinary people. And maybe we should say, more than anything else, the duty of the left in Europe today lies with the young people. Who is going to give hope to the jobless young people of Europe, if not the left? Uh, we cannot have a system that constantly privatizes the gains and socializes the losses. But that's what we had and still have. And believe me, they are going to restore it again if they get the peace to do it. They are hoping that the crisis will soon be forgotten and we will go to sleep again so they can bring in all the same practices and keep on going to create bubbles with enormous gains and then comes a crisis and then a bubble again and so on. So we will be locked in this vicious cycles if we don't do something about it. So there's high time for the left in Europe to demand the social and ecological issues on the agenda. And that is our duty. So there are these different ways to tackle these problems and that we should emphasis. To you, Alexis and Syriza, all I can say is I wish you good luck from the bottom of my heart. I really hope you succeed in getting to power and forming a left government in Greece. I think I'm convinced that it will be good for Greece, but most of all good for the ordinary people and the low income groups and the socially weak. And that's where our first duty lies. That is to take care of those that have a weak position, that have no one else to speak for themselves, and the same as with the environment that has no voice except the one that we give to it. So let us be the voices of those who either have a weak or no voice and take care of their interests. Of course, it's important you try to prepare yourself as well as possibly. You have realistic ideas about what is achievable you try to promise less and deliver more. Do as much as you can, as quickly as you can, because time is, lim is limited and patience is also limited. Remember the social dialogue, no matter how loaded with work you are. It's extremely important to have the social dialogue to explain why you think you have to do the, take the measures you're taking. And I'm speaking from experience because this is what where we failed. We <laughs> simply didn't have the stamina, the time, or the energy. We were so loaded in the rescue work that the social dialogue was not uh, uh, successfully carried out from our side. That is one of the explanations why we were then voted out, because we lost the debate, we lost the social dialogue. Well, I've used up all my time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all the best to you. Good luck. <laughs>